Uh, well, thanks and, and welcome to Stanford and to uh, FSI. Uh, as Jonah said, I'm the director of something called the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. So we look at political change, uh, the development of national level political institutions, the question of democracy around the world is very uh, you know, central to uh, what we do. Uh, and um, I would just, by the way, like to say that I, I really appreciate meeting with this group. Bo uh, both of my sons uh, spent time in community college and it was the most helpful period of their lives because both of them were undergoing rather difficult transitions and if it weren't for that institution they really would have been I think at, at a big you know at a big loss. I, I really do um, very much appreciate what you do. So I thought uh, what I would do is just talk about uh, this book. So this this is um, the second of two volumes which was uh, it's kind of absurdly ambitious project that I started about 10 years ago uh, to basically describe where political institutions came from. The reason that I started thinking about this was actually out of a kind of practical uh, wrestling with American foreign policy. So, you know, September 11th happened, we invaded Afghanistan, and then in 2003 we invaded Iraq. Uh, I was very much part of those debates, those foreign policy debates, both about the wisdom and then how you actually, what do you do once you've come to occupy a country. Uh, and in both of those places, you, you essentially had these collapsed states. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of Iraq, we were the cause of the collapse of the state. Uh, and you couldn't solve the problem of terrorism, uh, you know, uh, and today you cannot solve the problem of terrorism in Syria or Iraq, you know, with ISIS, unless you can figure out the question of how do you create a durable state institution that can exert some authority over, uh, you know, over a piece of territory. And that was the thing that we were, we've been wrestling with uh, ever since then. Uh, and that, I think, is at the core of our foreign policy problem, that uh, the reason that you have terrorism in Syria, Iraq, northern Nigeria, Mali, Yemen, you know, all of these places, is that there's no government in, 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 in any of these places that can actually provide security uh, to its own citizens and therefore security to other people that are uh, affected by that kind of uh, phenomenon. And then it, it struck me, well, here I'm a political scientist and <clears throat> I should know about where something like the state comes from, but they never taught that to me, you know, they, they never taught that to me in, in graduate school. Uh, where does the rule of law come from? We go around the world saying, you know, you need a strong rule of law, you know, uh, in order to defeat corruption and so forth. Well, where did our rule of law come from? And uh, so on and so forth. And so this was kind of the origin of this book. And so I started uh, going all the way back to the beginning. I also did a lot of consulting work for the World Bank back in the 2000s in places like Papua New Guinea. So not too many people have been to Papua New Guinea or other parts of Melanesia, but you know, these are among the most primitive societies anywhere on earth. I mean, no European went up into the highlands of Papua New Guinea until the 1930s, and it's still a society that's organized tribally, and yet they've got you know, supposedly a Westminster system of government. You know, they have a parliament and they vote, and, uh, have been ever since independence, but the institutions work in a very, very weird way because everybody is still organized tribally. And so when they go to vote, they vote for their tribal leader, the big man, you know, that gives them pigs and, you know, and uh, uh, distributes, you know, various kinds of goodies, including construction contracts and other things, you know, from international donors. And uh, <clears throat> so that also reinforced this notion that you know, everybody started out in this kind of society and somehow we got to these modern institutions, but I had very little idea of how this, you know, all this came about. So that's why you've got these two 500-page books now. This is my <laughs> effort to explain this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very gratified that a lot of, uh, you know, in a lot of college courses have now adopted this because uh, one of the things is in political science, we tend not to write a lot of textbooks or there's not a, it's not like economics where there's these 
kind of big name, you know, kind of well-established textbooks. And I think this, there's also a pedagogical purpose in this because, uh, you know, it would be a way of helping to, you know, teach just this basic history, which some, you know, if, if you take a history course at Stanford, uh, it's not going to help you with this kind of issue because there are, you know, the professional historians want to look at really, really narrow, very, very specialized issues. And uh, I think there's something to be said for having a more synoptic, you know, kind of broader view. So that's the general, that's the general uh, background to, uh, to this. So if you think about the world today, political order is actually a very, very critical question. Some parts of the world have, uh, in a way, too much political order. <laughs> Uh, if you think about Eurasia, you've got Russia and China, which are big centralized states that have powerful militaries and they've got agendas and they, you know, they're kind of in control of what they're doing. That provides one set of problems, but it's actually a fairly familiar one. But this other part of the world, which includes sub-Saharan Africa, the Arab world, uh, much of the greater Middle East, uh, all the way to the borders of India, you know, is a world that basically is, is fundamentally lacking in, in basic political institutions. So as I said, that's one of the reasons I think you see terrorism gravitating to these weak state, uh, you know, these weak state kinds of areas. And I think that this is a kind of general problem uh, with the success of democracy uh, around the world uh, is the fact that uh, states uh, are, are uh, weak and cannot provide citizens with the fundamental uh, goods, services, uh, protections that, uh, you know, that people, uh, that people uh, expect. And I think actually that as Americans, we have not focused on the right issues in the kinds of advice we've given and in the kinds of nation building exercises that we have been involved in because in a certain sense, I think we've overemphasize democracy at the expense of actually having uh, a basic state that can provide order. So <clears throat> conceptually, uh, I think in a modern uh, political order, you really have to have three different sets of institutions, okay? So the first institution is the state itself. The state was defined by Max Weber, a great German sociologist, as being a legitimate monopoly of force over a defined territory. I think that remains a very good definition uh, because it distinguishes the state from a labor union or a transnational NGO or a lot of other kinds of social organizations. States are about power. They are about power, but they're a particular kind of power that is legitimate, uh, where people agree that the state has a right to go and arrest people that break the law. And other kinds of institutions don't have that, don't have that ability. Um, <coughs> actually, is it possible to get a, um, some water? I've had this cough that, um, no, it's okay, he'll, he'll, he'll get something. Or she'll get something. Uh, so, um, all right, so that's institution number one, all right? Um, great, thank you very much. Okay, good. I was told to send this up too. Mm. <laughs> Good, thank you. I, um, so institution number two is the rule of law, okay? So the rule of law, I would define in the following way. There are a lot of definitions, almost as many definitions as law professors. Uh, but in my view, uh, it's not the rule of law if the law does not constrain the most powerful people in a society. Right, so if the law is just commands of the emperor saying do this and don't do that, that's what we might call rule by law. But rule of law is when the emperor himself or the king himself has to obey the law, is, uh, is underneath the law. And if you're a president who can make up the law as you go along or evade the law when it's convenient uh, for you to do so, that's not the rule of law. Right, so if you think about the state on the one hand and the rule of law on the other, they pull in opposite directions. The state is about accumulating and using power, uh, 
and the law is fundamentally about limiting power. It's limiting power according to certain agreed upon rules, all right? And then the third institution would be institutions of democratic um, accountability, meaning that the government ought to be accountable not just to the elites that run the government, they ought to be as accountable as possible to the whole population. And so today we interpret that as um, free and fair multi-party elections. Uh, but the point of these procedures is to achieve substantive accountability, meaning that the government really needs to be responsive to you know, as many of its citizens as, uh, as possible. And if you think about accountability in that way, uh, it, it's on the law side of the scale. So you have the power institution, which is the state, and then you have two institutions that constrain the state. You have the law and you have democratic uh, accountability that limit the ability of this powerful state to do whatever uh, it wants. And I think that uh, the big uh, uh, challenge and the kind of miracle of modern politics is that you can have all three of them simultaneously, where you can have a state that's powerful enough to protect its citizens, to deliver basic services, to collect taxes, to do the things that states do, and yet is constrained by these other institutions so that it stays within the boundaries of uh, what uh, you know, its, own citizens, uh, its own citizens want. And obviously, uh, if you've got a state without rule of law and democracy, you've got a dictatorship. On the other hand, if you only have uh, institutions of constraint but no state, you've got something like Afghanistan where you know, they have elections but the state can't protect its own people and uh, you know, it can't deliver basic services, so on and uh, so forth. Uh, there's a fourth uh, important definition which I think is actually critical for understanding the way the current world is shaping up, which is the, defini uh, the difference between uh, what Max Weber called a patrimonial state and a modern state. So a patrimonial state is a state where the government is regarded as, as a species of private property. You know, it's, a, it's literally a patrimony. So when you had kings and queens, the king could give a province to uh, his daughter as a wedding present with all the inhabitants that lived in the province because he owned the province. You know, it was part of his dynastic uh, possessions. So today, uh, we don't have very many rulers that claim they own their countries. Uh, what we have instead is what political scientists call neo-patrimonialism, where you may have you know, elected presidents and parliaments and so forth, but the whole reason that people are in politics is basically to enrich themselves. You know, they want to make use of the, the state, the government, in order to enrich themselves and their families. Uh, and this is the source of you know, the very pervasive political corruption that you know, exists in very, very many uh, societies. And by contrast, a modern state, at least this is the aspiration, a modern state tries to be impartial uh, or impersonal, meaning your relationship to the state doesn't depend on whether you're a cousin of the emperor or the cousin of the president or something. Uh, it just depends on your status as citizen, and the state tries to treat everybody uh, in, an, in a fairly uh, impartial way. Uh, and there's a strong distinction between public and private, right? So the money that belongs to the public treasury is not your money. You can't spend that money. Uh, and that means that you know, it's only in a modern state that you can have this phenomenon we call corruption. Corruption is when you when the ruler appropriates for his own private uses money that really belongs uh, to the public or should be serving uh, the public interest. And I would say that actually in today's world, uh, the bigger and more, in, in many ways, more important division is between, uh, on the one hand, patrimonial or neo-patrimonial uh, states and modern states. Uh, and these days less between democracies and authoritarian uh, regimes. I'll give you some examples of this. So in Ukraine, uh, the current crisis going on in Ukraine, uh, Russia, you know, over Crimea and so forth. So uh, I would say that the big issue there is actually not democracy. So Mr. Putin does not have a democratic bone in his body as far as I can see. But the bigger problem with Russia, I think, is that it is a neo-patrimonial country. Uh, 
You know, he is reputed to be one of the richest men in the world. Uh, he and his cronies had managed to appropriate Russian state institutions to their own benefit, which they run, you know, for their private benefit. He had a, his personal secretary, you know, just had a wedding in Europe somewhere where he rented this $40 million yacht, you know, and he gets paid a salary of $50,000 a year, something like this, you know. So this, you know, the, and, 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 but on the other hand, Mr. Putin is a democratically elected president. It may not be a completely free and fair election, but all of the polls, uh, everything we know about Russian public opinion indicates that if there is an election in Russia tomorrow, uh, he would be elected by a really large margin. And so the problem, I, you know, I think that the West has with him is not that he's not a democratically legitimated leader, it's that he's a crook, you know, that he uh, is a kleptocrat and that he's presiding over a kleptocratic regime whose existence, the purpose of whose existence is basically to suck money out of the Russian public treasury, you know, and appropriate it for private purposes. And that, frankly, was the big issue that led to this uprising in Maidan in um, Ukraine. And all these young uh, Ukrainians had this choice of either going with Russia, this kleptocracy, or trying to join the European Union. And they, they had no question which one they wanted. You know, they wanted to be with the modern society, the, the society where public interest mattered, where corruption was not uh, endemic. And their former president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, you know, basically changed his mind at the last minute and was trying to drag them back into this Russian uh, morass. And that's why there's a big popular, you know, uprising uh, and so forth. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's what the issue is. I think it's, it's, it's less the, 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 you know, democracy in terms of elections and it's more the quality of the state. Uh, and whether you're living in a modern state. Uh, to give you another example of how poor state quality really hurts things and makes democracy itself um, problematic, you take the example of India. So India is a really good democracy and it has been, except for a brief period in the 1970s, it's been a very good democracy, very impressive democracy since independence in the 19, late 1940s. So. They have competitive elections. There's a lot of competing parties. There's a free press, uh, you know, a lot of individual freedom to criticize the government. So in the late 1990s, uh, there was an activist named Jean Drez who did a study of elementary education in a number of poor states in northern India. And he discovered that 50% of all of the school teachers in these uh, public uh, schools were being paid, but they weren't showing up for work. 50% of teachers, right? And so there's this, right? I mean, I presume you all show up for your classrooms every day and you don't have an absentee rate anywhere close to this, but 50% of teachers were doing this. And uh, so nobody in India thinks this is a good idea, right? Uh, so there's a big hue and cry. All the opposition parties start criticizing the government. The media, you know, stays on top of this. They do all of these reforms, you know, including doing things like putting TV cameras in every single classroom to show, see whether the teacher was there or not. And after 10 years of attempting to reform the system, they do another survey. And it turns out that almost the identical number of teachers aren't showing up for work. They aren't able to solve this problem. Uh, and you know, if you've spent any time in developing countries, you'll see that this is just the tip of the iceberg with regard to the ability to kind of enforce rules, you know, in terms of, you know, traffic tickets and registering, you know, your company or, uh, you know, doing a lot of things that we take for granted in the United States or in other developed countries. Many things that the public sector is supposed to do uh, in a developing country just don't get done. Uh, and this is a problem with state quality, and I think this is why people uh, are unhappy with democracy. Uh, and in fact, they elected uh, Narendra Modi as prime minister of India by a very impressive majority, uh, you know, almost a year and a half ago, because I think a lot of people in India were sick and tired of a weak government that couldn't, you know, they'd make decisions to do something and then nothing would happen. They can't build infrastructure, they can't modernize their water, electricity, roads, you know, this sort of thing. And they wanted somebody that could actually <clears throat> get things done, whether 
Mr. Modi is actually the one that's going to do this. I mean, he's actually been, I think, disappointed the expectations of a lot of uh, people that voted for him because he's running up against, you know, I think some of the same institutional uh, constraints that, um, you know, that plagued his, his predecessors. Uh, but it certainly makes people unhappy and, you know, I think it hurts the quality of democracy. Uh, so a third example uh, is uh, closer to Europe, which is Greece, right? So Greece got into a lot of trouble 2010 uh, during the Euro crisis, uh, it triggered the Euro crisis because it um, borrowed a lot of money and couldn't pay it back, right? Why did it borrow so much money? Well, it's not because Greece is, I mean, so, so first of all, Greece is, a, is a, also, like India, a very successful democracy. Uh, it was under a military dictatorship un until 1974. After 1974, you had two political parties, PESOC, which was center-right, and uh, New Democracy, center, no, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. PESOC was a center-left party, and, and New Democracy was a center-right party. They alternated in vigorously contested elections. Periodically, they changed places, uh, and yet they got into this big problem. Why? The reason was that um, these are what are called clientelistic parties, meaning that every time one of them was elected into office, they filled the entire Greek public sector with their own party workers. And <clears throat> in Greece, they've got a law against firing civil servants. So every time there's a changeover in parties, uh, instead of replacing all the members of the other party, they would just hire a bunch of new people. Uh, and you got to this point where the per capita number of civil servants in Greece was several times uh, you know, the, 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 the per capita number in Britain or other uh, European Union countries, and so that's why they had a budget deficit. You know, they couldn't afford to pay for all of these uh, 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 public officials that were basically not doing very much, uh, doing very much useful. Uh, so again, the problem in Greece is not democracy. It has a vigorous democracy. The problem is really, it doesn't have a modern state. Uh, the state is used as a source of patronage for the political elites. And I would say that Europe is not out of this crisis yet because they fundamentally haven't, you know, they haven't solved this problem. They've, <laughs> they've considered selling the Parthenon, but they've not considered ending this practice of packing, you know, the public sector with, with political appointees. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so this, um, I think, indicates that, you know, the fracture line in, in, in the world and, and the really difficult challenge is in, in a certain sense less getting to a democracy than getting to a modern democracy, getting to an effective modern state. Uh, that's a harder transition. It's a, it's a transition that I called the problem of getting to Denmark. And so Denmark, I don't mean the actual country Denmark necessarily. Denmark's kind of a symbol for a country that's rich, uh, democratic, stable, uh, and has vanishingly low levels of, of corruption. You know, there's all these international indicators that, that try to measure levels of corruption. Denmark, you know, Singapore, Norway, they all always, almost always end up at the top of the league tables um, uh, in, in regard to this. And, you know, the United States in its foreign policy has wanted to try to create little Denmarks all over the place in Haiti, Somalia, Afghanistan, the Congo, and we, we don't get anywhere close to this. <laughs> You know, it would actually be nice to turn them into Indonesia or something, but we can't even really get to that point. Uh, and so the, you know, the, so it, it's a very tough problem. And, and the question is, how did any country make that transition from a patrimonial or a neo-patrimonial system to a modern system? So that's the, that's the point I'm going to try to now illustrate by reference to American history, because this happened in the United States uh, in the 19th century, and I think that Americans don't understand, you know, the way their own institutions uh, develop. Because when they look at a Mexico or India, Brazil, you know, any one of these developing countries that has a lot of corruption, a lot of political patronage, clientelism, and so forth, you say, ah, oh, 
you know, these people don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what a modern government is supposed to look like. Uh, and, uh, you know, how could they be that ignorant? <laughs> and I think the issue is that it's not a matter of ignorance. Uh, it's, I think, a kind of natural evolution uh, in early democracies. Uh, and I think the single proof of this is the history of the United States itself. So I'm sure a lot of you teach American history, but if I can give my own canned history of the development of bureaucracy in the United States, uh, it would go something like this. So if you ask the question, who ran the US government uh, in the early days after the, uh, the revolution, uh, you could say it was kind of the friends of George Washington. Meaning, first of all, the federal government was very, very small at that time. They had some customs inspectors. They had a post office uh, at a national level. They had <coughs> not even a standing army. They just had state militias. There was a navy. That was about it. So the revenue needs were very, very small. Um, and most of the government was staffed by uh, elites at that time. That's what I mean by the friends of George Washington, meaning a lot of them were graduates of Harvard, Yale, Princeton. They all came from either the planter class in Virginia or the merchant gentry class in New England. Uh, and um, uh, that is a situation that persisted really up until the 1820s. In the 1820s, uh, America started to really democratize. So as you're aware, uh, there are all of these qualifications, property qualifications on the franchise uh, in the early days in the United States. Uh, and by the late 1820s, basically most states had dropped them so that all white males could vote. So you still didn't have women's suffrage or certainly African Americans were still slaves, but all of a sudden all white men could vote. Uh, and the first uh, you know, major election that was affected by this opening of the franchise was the ele election of 1828, which brought Andrew Jackson to power. So Andrew Jackson ran against John Quincy Adams. And in a way, this is a classic pairing in American politics, which exists up until the 2016 election. Uh, John Quincy Adams was a Boston Brahmin. Uh, he was the son of John Adams, the second president of the United States. He had been educated at Harvard. He traveled in Europe as a young man. He could speak foreign languages, very well-educated, cosmopolitan uh, guy. Uh, Andrew Jackson was a frontiersman from rural Tennessee. He probably didn't even have a high school education. Uh, he was a brawler, a drinker, Scotch-Irish, you know, backwoodsman. Uh, but he was also a very successful military leader. He in a couple of very brutal campaigns, you know, against the Cherokees and the Seminoles, you know, essentially drove them out of their territories. And then he ended up as the victor in the Battle of New Orleans against the British during the War of 1812, which is what propelled him onto a national stage. So he wins the, uh, so, so just if you keep in your mind these two gentlemen running against each other, uh, you know, John Quincy Adams is like the John Kerry, you know, of, of his day. Uh, John Kerry went to Yale and he can speak French and, you know, comes from a rather privileged background. And, you know, essentially, um, Jackson is not, I mean, he's more like Sarah Palin than Donald Trump, uh, in that Donald Trump himself, you know, came from a very privileged background. So, but, you know, Jackson was a populist. I mean, he was the first American populist and he mobilized a lot of popular anger against northeastern elites, all these Harvard and Yale educated people like John Quincy Adams that had been running the American government up to that point. And because the franchise had expanded, uh, you know, there are a lot of new voters that had never voted in their lives. Most of them didn't have, uh, you know, much more than about a fourth grade education. Uh, and these were the people that, that supported him. You know, he, just like Ron Paul, he didn't like, you know, the idea of a national bank, which had been Alexander Hamilton's pet project, you know, to have a bank of the United States. So he basically undermined that. So it's kind of like <coughs> distrusting the Federal Reserve today. Uh, and when he was elected in 1828, he said two things. He said, first of all, I won the election, so I should choose who runs the American government. And secondly, uh, in 
I'm paraphrasing now, he said, it doesn't take a genius to run the American government. Any ordinary American can do it. And so this inaugurates this period in American history known as the patronage or the spoils system in which virtually every office in the American government from the federal government all the way down to your local fourth class postmaster is put there as a result of a payoff from a politician to a political supporter, right? And so essentially, once the system gets going, every time the Republicans uh, replace the Democrats or vice versa in you know, your local state legislature, every postmaster is fired and replaced by a postmaster with allegiance to the other party that just won the election. Uh, and then in you know, eastern and southern American cities, you have these big city machines in Boston, Chicago, New York, you know, Tammany Hall, uh, all of which operate according to this patronage principle that basically I trade, you know, I give you an individual benefit like a Christmas turkey or a job uh, on the police force in return for your voting for me, you know, on election day. It is no different from what goes on in India, Brazil, Mexico, you know, any number of developing countries today. Uh, and this is what makes me think that <clears throat> if, if you call this corruption, and, and it did lead to a substantial amount of corruption, but if you call this corruption, I would say that in that case, corruption, I think, is a kind of natural stage in the, develop, in the early development of democracies. You know, because why did this happen in the United States? Well, founding fathers, uh, as you, I'm sure, are well aware, did not imagine uh, the need for political parties. But the moment you opened up the franchise and you had to get thousands of people out to the polling place, you needed an organization that could mobilize voters. Uh, so that's the origin of a political party. And then how do you get uh, poorly educated and not very wealthy voters to go out and vote on election day? Well, you don't do it by saying, oh, you know, we need to change our policy towards the British-French alliance, you know, or something like that. You do it by saying, I'll give you a job, you know, I'll, or I'll give you a bottle of brandy or something, you know, uh, if, you, if you vote for me. Uh, and I think this is the process that goes on in, you know, poor democracies today, that you need to mobilize a lot of voters, and the easiest way to do it is essentially by bribing them uh, individually, all right? So by the time you get to the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, if you read his letters, especially when he's reelected in 1864, he's just inundated with office seekers, and it's just, you know, it's just a plague. He has to spend the first six months of his term meeting with individuals who supported him during the election campaign and they think they deserve uh, you know, a government position. So the United States is very similar to many contemporary demo uh, uh, you know, young democracies in the developing world. How did this end or how did we get out of this? Uh, this all began to change in the 1880s. So in the 1880s, the United States is going through this very large socioeconomic transition. At that point, the leading technology, the internet of that day, is, is the railroads. Railroads are tying the United States together in a big national market. So all of these isolated farm communities in Iowa and Kansas can all of a sudden ship all their grain to Chicago and then put it on a boat and send it to Europe, right? So the scale of the economy expands tremendously and the country begins to urbanize and industrialize. Uh, a lot of people begin to feel that this old kind of incompetent patronage-based governmental system isn't serving them uh, terribly well, but they cannot bring about political change. Why? So what are the incentives of members of Congress at this point? So there was something called the Pendleton Act that was proposed um, by a congressman named George Pendleton to create a modern civil service that was not patronage based. Why would, what, if you're a member of Congress in the year 1882 or three, what are your incentives? Would you support the, something like the Pendleton Act? Well, think about it. How did all these guys get elected in the first place? By patronage, by patronage right? So they have zero they have zero incentive to vote for a system that they got them into office and they manipulated. So 
this is another truth about political reform, is that political reform fails not because people don't understand that there's a better system out there. It fails because all of the incumbent power holders don't want it to succeed, you know, because they profit from the current system, right? So Pendleton Act's proposed, and it doesn't go anywhere. So the only reason that something happens is in 1882, um, <clears throat> James Garfield is elected president. Uh, he is shot uh, by a would-be office seeker, this guy named Charles Guiteau, that thought he should be appointed the consul, U.S. consul to France. He doesn't get the job. He gets pissed off, shoots the president. Garfield takes about six weeks to die, this very painful death. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there's this big uproar about patronage because here the president had been assassinated by a patronage seeker. And so even the outgoing Congress is embarrassed into uh, actually voting for the Pendleton Act. And then a new Congress is elected in 1884 uh, that shifts the balance into people that actually you know, now want reform. And so what does the Pendleton Act do? It establishes a principle that you should get a job in the federal government if you pass a civil service examination. And you should be promoted on the basis of technical knowledge and merit, and not because of your political uh, connections. Uh, but the rearguard action of the two political parties is such that they only permit an extension of classified employment uh, when their party loses, and they want to protect all of their <laughs> political appointees you know, that are already in the government. So they say, all right, well, they can be their positions can be classified, and after they die, you can appoint them with someone qualified. But, uh, and so it takes another 40 years until you know, majority of positions in the U.S. government are classified positions as opposed to patronage positions. Uh, and by the way, even today, compared to a European government where if you have a changeover in administrations in a typical parliamentary democracy in Europe, the minister and maybe the vice minister in each cabinet department will change. Uh, so a total of maybe a couple dozen people will turn over when an administration changes. In the United States, we still change about four or 5,000 positions every time the Republicans replace the Democrats or vice versa in, you know, in the White House. So we still have a pretty high level of old-fashioned political patronage. Um, so, uh, so I think I would draw the following lessons from that story, which is that First of all, uh, you know, you know, in a certain way, living in a patronage-filled, corrupt political system is not unusual. It's not a pathological condition. I think it's actually a normal condition, and it's particularly a normal condition for young democracies. Uh, and you actually have to take very special measures to get out of this situation. Uh, and the way that you get out of it is essentially political. So. In a way, democracy was created, what created the problem. You know, how do you get voters motivated to vote for you? But democracy, it turned out, was also the solution because by the 1880s, enough Americans had joined the middle class. You know, they were more educated. They had more wealth. They were more interested in having a high-quality government. They were really quite sick of having these political hacks, you know, running all of their local political institutions. And so there's a kind of groundswell during the progressive era uh, for this kind of change. And there's also very good leadership you know, from people like Theodore Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, who, you know, in fact, Roosevelt was one of the first uh, chairmen of the US Civil Service Commission. Uh, you know, was very interested in having a high quality government. Woodrow Wilson was actually a professor of public administration at Johns Hopkins before he became president or went on to be president of Princeton and then president of the United States. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, things came together to bring about this kind of reform. So I'm going to close just by talking about the United States uh, today because uh, I actually think that we're in a, a kind of bad situation because I think that the system has now reverted. My term is this very long word, repatrimonialization. <laughs> But I think that you know this, the American system has undergone decay. So the word political decay is in the title of my book. And I'm afraid that that's, in my view, what's happened. So my def I've got a very specific definition of decay. So decay is, is the product of two things. It's when the institutions are rigid and, and they don't change, they don't adapt you know, sufficiently to meet 
you know, new circumstances. And they also decay because there's a universal tendency of elites to try to capture the political system and use it for their own ends. This is not just a feature of democracy. If you read the first volume of my book, where I talk about, you know, dynastic China and the Ottoman Empire and, you know, old regime France, I mean, you, you saw versions of decay in all of these, in all of these political systems. Uh, but we tend to favor friends and family and people that have a lot of power and wealth, you know, tend to use their power and wealth to basically protect themselves and protect their children, protect their friends. Uh, and I think we've got a version of that in the United States. Uh, and, and the basic problem, I think, is, is kind of the, it's the collision of two different broad things. So one is in American society. Uh, several things have changed over the last 30 years. Uh, one of them is polarization. Uh, you know, this is something political scientists can actually measure pretty well. I mean, for most of American, well, not for, I shouldn't say, we have been this polarized in the late 19th century and before the Civil War, but for most of the 20th century, you know, the two uh, American political parties had a very substantial degree of overlap. All of the major legislation, you know, the New Deal, the Great Society, the Reagan tax cuts, they were all passed by Congresses in which presidents could form coalitions that they may have relied more on one party than the other, but basically it had to be bipartisan in order to get the thing through Congress. Today they're completely split apart. So the most liberal Republican is considerably more conservative than the most conservative Democrat, all right? That's one thing that's happened. The other thing is the rise of very well-organized and very um, well-resourced interest groups. Uh, you know, so many, many of these groups represent corporate interests. You know, the banking lobby is, you know, one of the most powerful lobbies out there, but not all of them. So you've got public sector unions, you've got, like every disease in the United States has a lobby, you know. Kidney disease has a bunch of lobbyists in Washington that want more spending, more federal spending on, you know, research into kidney disease. Uh, so all of that is not uh, in itself bad. In fact, a democracy has to have interest groups. People have to be able to organize, you know, to express their views on all sorts of political issues. The question is whether our political system adequately represents the whole of the society as opposed to these very concentrated you know, kinds of interests. And here I would say that the other fact of American politics is its institutional structure, which in my view over-represents uh, the power of these concentrated interests. And this goes back to the basic design of our constitutional system. Right? So the American founding fathers, uh, were very worried about tyranny. You know, they had revolted against the British uh, monarchy and parliament. Uh, they wanted individual liberty. They did not want it encroached on by a king. <coughs> and they worried about an excessively powerful executive in, uh, in this new democracy. And as a result, they created this constitutional system of checks and balances that spreads uh, power out horizontally among a lot of different institutions. So <coughs> you have a very powerful upper house of Congress. Uh, you have a separately elected presidency that can be held by a different party. <coughs> and you have a judiciary that can overturn legislation. And then delegation to state and local you know, levels of government. So compared to, let's say, a British parliamentary system, you spread, you know, uh, power out in, in, in a lot of, of different ways. When you combine this check and balance system with polarization and with powerful interest groups, you get what I label in this book, vetocracy, meaning rule by veto, which is to say in our system we privilege minorities, you know, it's, it comes from this reasonable desire to avoid tyranny of the majority. We allow uh, minorities to block action by the whole <coughs> in ways that actually make collective action extremely difficult. Uh, and uh, it basically gives vetoes to all of these very powerfully organized groups. 
And that, among other reasons, is why Congress has not passed a budget, you know, under regular order for, I don't know, a decade or so now. The only reason Congress could actually pass a budget this year is that Speaker Boehner fell on his sword. You know, he knew that any kind of reasonable budget wouldn't be able to get through this Congress. Uh, and therefore, he had to, you know, plan to resign ahead of time in, in order to sneak the budget, uh, sneak the budget through. But it has a lot of other, you know, I think very negative consequences for the way we're governed. Uh, so, for example, I actually agree with the Republicans that the corporate tax rate is too high. It's 35 percent, which is much higher than the average for other OECD countries, uh, and that's why all these companies are doing these inversions and trying to incorporate themselves in Ireland and you know other low tax places. Uh, so most tax experts that I know of, both Republican and Democrat, have supported the basic idea that you should lower the nominal corporate tax rate to maybe 25, 20, 25 percent and then get rid of a whole bunch of special exemptions, subsidies, tax expenditures that are in our you know whatever 10,000 page tax code. Uh, so it would be revenue neutral. It would be much simpler, fairer, and it would solve you know this basic problem of why companies aren't willing to repatriate money back into the United States. We can't do it, despite the fact that all the experts think so and all the leaders in Congress think so. The problem is that there are too many individual special interests that would lose out uh, if you did this kind of a reform. So you know, you can't get rid of the mortgage interest deduction because the realtors don't like it. You can't get rid of you know, the oil and gas uh, investment subsidy because the energy companies don't like it, so on and so forth. And so this is what vetocracy means, that everybody can veto, but nobody has the authority to actually force a decision you know, that is collectively in the interest of the whole uh, political community. Uh, and I kind of think that this is where we've been. It's why our, the quality, you know, the, the legislation we do pass uh, is, uh, is just very poor quality. So, uh, you know, if you think about the two big achievements of the Obama administration, which are the Affordable Care Act and the Dodd-Frank uh, uh, bill on uh, regulating uh, the banking industry, you know, I support both of them. I think we needed both of these things, but they're terrible pieces of legislation, you know. I mean, they're both hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Uh, why are they that long? Uh, because our legislative process, you know, forces you to basically buy off all of these small concentrated interests in order to get anything uh, through Congress. And this is not the way it works in a parliamentary democracy. It's not the way it works in Germany or, you know, Australia or Canada or, you know, Great Britain, where, you know, this kind of legislation is not crafted as a result of this aggregation of small interests, but, you know, it's, it's a much uh, much more rational process. Uh, and so I think that we are kind of in a, uh, you, know, you know, it's not a crisis of the sort where the, the republic's going to collapse tomorrow as a result of this. Uh, but, you know, it may, we may elect Donald Trump, you know. <laughs> I mean, we may, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess actually what I find kind of funny about watching this process, the electoral process, is that Americans themselves do not understand their own political system. And so they actually imagine that the president is a kind of democratic dictator and that, you know, President Trump on the second day after he's elected is going to sign a piece of paper that says, build that wall, you know, <laughs> and the wall's just going to go up magically. And, you know, what they don't realize is they live in a vetocracy, meaning that even if Mr. Trump manages to get elected, he's still going to have all these constraints on his power that are not going to, and, you know, he may actually do better than Ted Cruz because he can actually negotiate, but, you know, every, every American president who's ever been successful has only been successful because they can build coalitions, you know, and they can actually work with people that don't agree with them and kind of cobble together something out of this extremely heterogeneous mass, of, you know, that's called uh, that's called Congress, uh, but it is worrisome, you know, for the future because I think that, you know, the kind of political system that the founding fathers created was, you know, it was quite adequate for the kind of agrarian society with a very small government that didn't really do much. But unfortunately, we're not living in that kind of a world anymore. Uh, you know, you have to have institutions like the Federal Reserve. For better or worse, we've got this. 
whole set of international commitments and a big national security structure and all of these things, uh, you know, need to be managed, uh, you know, a lot better. And I think we're not uh, doing that good a job at it. And by the way, I mean, so just to connect this to the stuff that I said at the beginning, I do think that this affects America's place in the world and the, the prestige of democracy because right after the Cold War, when I wrote my first book, The End of History, uh, the United States was far and above, you know, the most powerful country. It looked very successful economically, politically, you know, uh, everything else. Uh, and many countries around the world, you know, wanted to be like the United States. Uh, and I've noticed this just in my own students, you know, who are non-American, that that degree of respect isn't there anymore, you know. So a lot of foreigners, including very friendly ones that would like to think well of the United States, you know, they kind of look at Washington and say, oh, what the hell's going on here? You know, it's, I mean, there's some, there seems to be something wrong with your democracy. Uh, and so I think that fixing this problem is something that's quite important uh, because I do think that it then affects, you know, the appeal of democracy outside of the United States. So, uh, so why don't I just, I s stop talking and, you know, maybe we could open it up. Yeah. More about the fixing yes. part. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, the fixing. Any solutions? Well. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump. No. <laughs> the uh, the fix is complicated because our constitution is extremely hard to amend. Uh, you know, if you could start all over again, uh, I think I would actually shift from a presidential to a parliamentary system because I just think they work better. But it's not going to happen in the United States in a million years. Uh, and I think even uh, modest constitutional changes like reversing Citizens United that basically has liberated all of this money you know, for, for uh, campaigns uh, is not going to happen. I mean, maybe <clears throat> now that uh, Justice Scalia has passed away, uh, you might have a little bit of opening to shift things on the court, but that's how you got to do it. I mean, until the Supreme Court decides differently, uh, there isn't that much you can do in the realm of controlling campaign finance. Uh, so we actually, uh, we have a project here at my center on American politics and comparative perspective. Usually Americans don't like to think about other democracies because we think our democracy is perfect and we're not going to learn anything from, you know, Canada or, you know, Germany or anything. But in fact, you know, I think in a lot of domains, uh, other countries do do things better. So one example of that is election administration uh, and redistricting. I mean, we, do th we have this ridiculous system where we allow the political parties to control both of those processes. Uh, and um, in, I think, better designed democracies, they turn this over to, you know, uh, uh, impartial you know, commissions that, uh, that, that, that do these functions. Uh, I think in terms of, um, well, the really big problems like budgeting, you know, one possible solution, if, if the perception of the problem gets sufficiently serious, you could go to something like the Base Realignment Commission or uh, you know, fast track authority in, in the trade realm, where these are both areas where there was a realization that these powerful local interests were so powerful that you couldn't get any progress at all if you left it simply up to them. And therefore, they designated, you know, uh, a, a, a larger group that would make the decisions and then give it to Congress in a single up or down vote. So the Base Realignment Commission did that. They came up with a rational plan for how to allocate the pain of base closings across the whole of the United States without regard to political, you know, the fact that this base was in this home district of the Speaker of the House and, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, and then the whole Congress could vote it up or down as a whole. And similarly with fast, fast track authority, or tr I guess they now call it trade promotion authority, uh, with regard to, you know, the TPP and other measures. So <clears throat> you could try to do something like that with the budget as a whole. You know, you could try to delegate it to, you know, a smaller, more expert group uh, and then present it to the whole Congress and they can either vote it up or down, but they can't amend it. 
Uh, and you know that's the way a parliamentary system kind of works. Uh, actually, with regard to campaign finance, <clears throat> short of changing the Supreme Court, uh, one idea that came out of our project is you basically would have to repair, uh, re, uh, repeal uh, McCain-Feingold, which had this unfortunate effect. It, it, it caps individual uh, donations at a fairly low level, but imposes no caps whatever to these political action committees under this fiction that they're not related to the campaign that they're actually helping, right? And so the result is that it limits actually legitimate money and it opens the floodgates uh, to all of this outside money uh, that actually, you know, in the Republican Party has been going to Tea Party challengers in primaries. And that has the effect of um, weakening the power of, you know, the party establishments. So the Republican Party establishment does not want Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or any of these characters that have been running. Uh, it's all kind of a grassroots movement and a lot of it fueled, you know, by outside money from very wealthy donors. Uh, so one idea is if you actually forced the money and channeled it through the parties that you would have less of this, you know, dispersion of, of the trouble is that it wasn't money that elected Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. I mean, you know, there really is a genuine democratic upsurge within at least that narrow segment of the electorate. So even that reform might not help. Another possibility that my colleague Larry Diamond has been very supportive of is to change the electoral system into something, his, um, his preference would be something like the Australian uh, system of limited preferences. So in Australia, this is what goes on in Oakland now, and, and I think in Portland or you know, a couple of cities around, they're all liberal cities you know, on the west coast of the United States, but it's basically where instead of, you have a, a first-past-the-post uh, system where you just elect one candidate, but you have to rank order your preferences. Uh, and so this avoids the Bush v. Gore problem with, with Nader in the 2000 election where most of Nader's voters would have vastly preferred uh, Gore over Bush, but they actually handed the election to you know, Bush because they, they took votes away from Gore. If you had these Australian rules, then all of the Nader voters would have uh, put uh, Gore down as their second choice. He would have been elect, uh, eliminated from the ballot in the second counting, and all of his votes would have been reallocated to uh, uh, to Al Gore, and Gore would have won the election in, in Florida, and then would have won the presidency. Uh, and what this does basically is it makes third-party challenges much more viable. Now, the problem with this is that it kind of assumes that there's this big pool of centrist, reasonable voters out there in America who actually are just waiting for a Michael Bloomberg or somebody, you know, that has their kind of moderate sensibilities to emerge, but somehow the two-party system is preventing that from happening. Maybe that's true, you know, maybe that's true, but I think uh, the way these primaries have been going, it kind of indicates that there isn't that much of a kind of moderate center out there, <laughs> uh, and that voter preferences are actually polarizing, you know, towards more extreme candidates. Uh, so even the introduction of this thing wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't help much. So there are these small things, I think, that you can consider doing, but I'm afraid that, you know, collectively, are they going to solve our problem? Probably not. The other thing you can wait for is for one party to simply win a huge victory. This happened at several points in the 1896 election, in the 1932 election, you know, where one party controls the presidency, both houses of Congress, and then they've got a very big agenda and they somehow manage to get it through. Uh, but I'm not sure that demographically that's going to happen anytime soon. And because of gerrymandering, I think, you know, uh, it, 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 it may not happen for decades. Did you? Or, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you, if you're already talking about the coming elections, can you give your point of view about the Democrat uh, Party, about Hillary vs. Bernie Sanders? Because they're coming from yeah. two different point of views. Of yeah, well, 
<laughs> I mean, I, I think that, so here on, on the Stanford campus, you know, Sanders is the runaway favorite of, you know, most of the students. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, they're responding to a number of things. So one of them is just a frustration with centrist Democrats, you know, ever since, I mean, I actually think that Bill Clinton accomplished a fair amount and Obama actually accomplished a fair amount. But, you know, there's this, there's this, um, you know, this feeling that they have had to make too many compromises in order to, you know, uh, just stay in office and they don't want anyone that compromises like that. There's still a lot of anger at the banks and other big institutions, you know, left over from the 2008 crisis, which I think is quite reasonable. I'm angry too. Um, and that not enough has been done about that. And then I think, you know, a lot of it reflects Hillary's weaknesses as a candidate because I just think a lot of people regard her as not terribly authentic. And uh, so it's this combination of personality plus, you know, kind of pent up anger. Uh, so I think that the populism on both the right and the left is really driven by something very similar, um, which is, and, and this is, there's been more and more attention paid to this over the last few months, uh, which is the position of the, especially the white working class in the United States, uh, both Charles Murray on the right and Bob Putnam on the left have both written books on this in the last few years. The statistics are just, are, they're really shocking. And basically what they show is that if you have a high school education or less, your life chances and all these outcomes have just gone like this. On the other hand, if you're college educated or have some kind of professional degree, you've gone like this, right? So, uh, you know, there's a paper that got a lot of notice by this Angus Deaton who won this year's Nobel Prize in economics that life expectancies for white males, working class males has declined, you know, quite substantially uh, in the last, um, you know, 20 years. The only ethnic group for which this is true, 70% uh, of working class children or children of working class families are now growing up in a single parent family. Uh, you've got this, you know, opiate, uh, you know, epidemic going on. I mean, I think this came as a revelation to all of the candidates that in New Hampshire, what was the number one issue that voters cared about? It was heroin addiction. You know, because that was like the number one social problem uh, there. And I think that's true in rural, uh, you know, for rural white America, that's true in many, many places. You know, I suspect you're seeing that among your students. Um, uh, and um, meanwhile, you know, the people with higher educations have just gone, gone to town. You know, they're walking away with an increasing share of national income. and. Their families are more stable than they were before. You know, instead of single parent families, you've got helicopter parents that, you know, can't leave their children alone and send them, you know, to start an NGO in Africa when they're 13 years old and this sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, so there's a real, and so for the, you know, for the working class, it's not surprising that they want to make America great again because America is really not great for them anymore, you know? It really is not great. Their incomes are, real incomes are lower than they, their parents' generation and so forth, so why shouldn't they be angry, right? So I do think that Sanders and Trump are both, you know, they're kind of responding to, to that. Um, and nobody, uh, frankly, nobody in either party has done a damn thing for this group of people. And it's kind of, it's, it's sort of a, a paradox because the Democrats should normally be the party that would kind of be the party of the working class, but you know, they're very much into identity politics and white working class voters just don't, you know, culturally they just, that's not their kind of, that's not their cup of tea. Uh, and then the Republicans uh, up till now, you know, have actually been supporting economic policies that make their position worse off. And so I think now that's why you're getting this big split in the Republican Party. Yeah. Dr. Fukuyama, thank you again for being with us. And sure. You're, you're very busy. So thank you for taking the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to speak with us. I was wondering if I can get your thoughts about current events here, shifting the topic to political mm -hmm. economy. Um, speak about American hegemony, the future of mm -hmm. American hegemony. In, in, what, in lieu of what's happening, of course, in 
and China, the slowing down of China. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see the United States uh, in the next, maybe perhaps 20, 30 years as a, yeah. <clears throat> an economic powerhouse? Unto well, we're going to be an economic powerhouse in 20, 30 years. There's no question about that. I think that what was really unusual was this period from uh, the end, of, from the fall of the Berlin Wall up until the financial crisis when the United States was far and above the most powerful country in the world. And that all changed uh, in, a in a dramatic way after the financial crisis because both America and Europe had this big slowdown and China kept going. Uh, and so now I think we're just reverting to the mean. I mean, in most periods in international history, you had many great powers. And, you know, China historically was always a great power, and now they're back. So, you know, there's not, it's not surprising that relative to China, we've lost a lot of ground. Uh, I happen to think that the Chinese story is not going to be simply a continuation of this double-digit growth perpetually into the future. I think they're headed for very rocky times because they're already slowing down very, very substantially. Uh, and unlike the United States, I think that their system doesn't have a fundamental inbuilt legitimacy that will allow them to survive a really bad economic setback. Or the way that they'll survive it is by appealing to Chinese nationalism, which is dangerous because in Asia as a whole, there's just there's way too much nationalism right now. Uh, and I actually think that everyone's very focused on the Middle East, but I would think that in the next generation, Asia is going to be, you know, a, it's got a lot of potential for, for real conflict. Um, so that's kind of my view of things. I think we, we Americans have to both adjust to it and you know, I mean, I think it was kind of stupid for us to stay out of this Asian infrastructure investment bank that the Chinese, I mean, they set it up because the Senate wasn't willing to ratify uh, this change uh, in the IMF that would have given China a greater role. And so the Chinese kind of said, well, screw you. If you're not going to do this, we're just going to set up our own bank. And we've got the money to do it. And so that's what happened. And now we don't want to join that one. So, so I think we could have been a little bit more you know, less short-sighted in the way that we, you know, we accommodated this rise. Yes? Is your, what I take it to be a comparative analysis of democracies uh, among nation states suggest anything about the solution set on an issue like global warming and equitable resource allocation across <coughs> nations? Well, not really. <laughs> Because unfortunately, I'm not sure that democracy actually necessarily buys you a better climate policy or, I mean, I, I sort of think that in the end, a lot of countries basically just follow their self-interest. And so countries heavily dependent on <clears throat> either the use of fossil fuels or the export of fossil fuels, you know, Canada, Australia, United States have been very, you know, been climate skeptics and dragging their heels and so forth. And, uh, it kind of reflects their, you know, their self-interest. Um, so uh, I don't think that, you know, and, and climate change is the hardest international cooperation problem to solve because it requires fairly steep upfront investments and the payoff not only doesn't come for another couple of generations, but it also accrues to people that are not citizens of your you know, your country. Uh, uh, and so it's very hard to get politicians to actually pay that upfront price. Uh, so actually, I think, you know, the COP21 stuff, you know, was actually pretty impressive that they managed to get as far as that with just these voluntary mm -hmm. declaration of good intentions. And I sort of think that they got to wait for technology to come rescue them, you know, where you'd have some alternative path that's not going to be that expensive. Uh, but, you know, I think we're not going to solve this problem anytime soon, as far as I can see. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, I would like to come back to the question uh, the, the question that you mentioned about how to fix problems with this uh, patrimonial status kind of things. And you mentioned about one solution that uh, one party will 
just win overwhelming kind of majority will take. And this is something will happen in Poland. I don't know if you are familiar with the situation in Poland. I would like to ask you about your opinion because yeah. the ruling party they overwhelming won the parliamentary elections and they got their president. And suddenly they're starting changing so quickly the law and going with this uh, changing with the, the Supreme Court. So kind of taking away. So it's kind of getting kind of caught kind of <coughs> right. of the system and then going driving much more toward this. System. Yeah, and Hungary, Hungary did something like this before Poland. Yeah, so um, I wasn't saying that a big victory by one party is going to lead to good policy. I'm just saying that this will break the current gridlock. Uh, Americans have actually tended to prefer gridlock over this kind of decisive policy change. Um, that's why you can't get rid of the Senate filibuster because, you know, the filibuster basically forces the Senate to have a supermajority to pay, pass ordinary legislation. Um, and neither party really wants to get rid of it because they always worry, well, if I'm in the minority, I'm going to want to block stuff that the other party is going to want to do. Uh, so yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, it's it's strong government can be used for good or it can be used for evil. <laughs> uh, that's just a fact of life. And what you need is sufficient strength in the government, but good policies. You know, at the same time. Um, so I'm actually not necessarily hoping for a, you know, uh, especially by one of the parties involved. Uh, you know. A big smashing victory. How about down at the? Yeah. I, I, I believe it was the governor of Texas was calling for a constitutional convention of states. How realistic do you think something like that? Well, it's completely unrealistic. Yeah. I mean, a you're not going to get agreement on on doing that, and even if you somehow did, you know, the problem with that is that the constitutional convention itself will be then prey to the same kinds of interest group pressures and that, that afflict our current institutions, that you know, it will be polarized and it will be manipulated by powerful interest groups and you know, so on and so forth. Um, you generally can only get to a constitutional convention after a big war, revolution, you know, financial collapse, I mean, something really, really calamitous uh, that just completely discredits the old system. So short of that, I, I just don't think it's realistic. Uh, yes? So I, you were talking about the 19th century and the US and the shift from neo-patrimonialism to a modern democracy. And then you mentioned your term, re-patrimonialization. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that today. Uh, if the forces driving this move to a modern democracy in the 19th century were the rise of a middle class, desire for a more stable government, do you see the flip happening today that this shrinking middle class is behind this move in the other not, direction? Not necessarily. I, I just think that <clears throat> you know, modern institutions are kind of unstable because they're not natural. It's natural for us to favor our friends and family. And modern institutions <clears throat> force us to say, no, 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 you're going to hire the most qualified person or you're going to forget about the identity of this job candidate uh, and just you know, choose on an impartial basis, despite the fact that you know that it's your cousin you know, or whatever. Uh, so I just think that you know, over time, and actually in, in, especially in times of relative peace and prosperity, there's just a natural human tendency for elites to kind of pad their own nests and it just goes on and then it has to be consciously reversed. So you had this big buildup of inequality in the 1920s, and then it brought about the you know the stock market uh, crash and the you know bank collapse and the Great Depression, and then that creates the basis for a populist coalition that you know then unites under the New Deal and and redistributes income and creates a social security system and all this stuff. So there has to be a kind of constant. Uh, resetting of the system if it's going to stay, you know, if it's going to stay modern. In the first volume of the book, I tell the story about a lot of other prior repatrimonializations. You know, the one that's the most extreme, uh, because the solution was the most extreme, was the one that was done by the Ottomans. So, you know, the Ottomans were living in a very tribal part of the world where family ties were very powerful. 
And in order to create a modern administrative system, essentially what they did was they went into the Balkans, they captured all these young boys, Christian boys, brought them back to Turkey, and then trained them to be soldiers and administrators and put their entire government in their control. Uh, and they forbade them to have children, uh, precisely because these were the only people they could trust to administer the system without favoring their own families. And this begins to break down because they want children. <clears throat> You know, so they start having children, and then they say, well, I want my child to have my position as a, as a janissary. So they say, okay, your, your son is in. And gradually, the whole kind of impersonal system then gets transformed into, uh, you know, it gets repatrimonialized in the system. And another great uh, example was the French monarchy before the French Revolution. So the French monarchy goes broke, you know, Louis XIV may have had a really nice chateau at Versailles, but he was completely broke. Uh, he spent, you know, building that chateau and fighting all of his wars uh, not only exhausted the French treasury, but it put the French state in incredible debt. Uh, and in order to just keep this machine going, he started selling, well, actually, it wasn't Louis XIV, it was Henry IV, so it happened actually a whole century before. but. These French kings would start selling off parts of the French state, including offices. And so the word venality comes from this practice of venal office holding, where the king would sell the position of treasurer of France to a rich individual. And once he bought that position, <clears throat> he could collect taxes in the name of the French state, but he could keep all the proceeds. Uh, and then there was this. Um, uh, this reform that was done in the early 17th century uh, where these offices could not only be bought but they were turned into heritable property and then you could pass it on to your children. So that same office would then become your son's property on your death. So talk about repatrimonial, I mean that's literal repatrimonialization. I mean that's literally selling the state off to wealthy individuals. So this happens, you know, this, <laughs> this happens, yes. We talked earlier about Greece and its, um, well, I guess, bloated bureaucracy, but also that, that taxation in Greece, is, tax evasion, excuse me, apparently had become a national yes. endeavor. Uh, so there's the other side of it. So what, I mean, in the context of a broader <coughs> issue of the Eurozone, how do you see what's happening there <coughs> playing out? Well, you know, tax evasion in Greece has a long history. Uh, <coughs> And it's not a cultural thing, necessarily. Um, so Greece was, in the early 19th century, part of the Ottoman Empire. And it was very common for Greeks to try to evade taxes because they didn't want to pay the Turks. You know, They didn't want to give tribute to the Turks, essentially. Uh, and then Greece is ruled by a whole bunch of foreign powers, or these foreign powers operate beneath, uh, behind the scenes. and. The indigenous Greek government is never seen as terribly legitimate. Uh, and in those cases, um, you know, why not cheat the state out of taxes? Because they're just going to waste it or use it for bad purposes. Uh, and so they have been trapped in this low tax, bad government equilibrium for quite a long time. And unfortunately, I think that we're kind of in that same equilibrium. So there are some countries where you have a high tax rate. So I'm thinking of Denmark. I actually spent time there as a visiting professor. Uh, their marginal, top marginal income tax rate used to be 63.5%. Really high taxes, like 300% uh, tax on automobiles. Um, and nobody in Denmark that I talked to at any rate really complained fundamentally about this because they said, well, we get such good services in return. You know, we don't have to save for our retirement. We don't have to pay health insurance. We don't have to pay for our children's education all the way through graduate school. So yeah, we pay high taxes, but we get a lot back. And so they're in this kind of high-level equilibrium where they've got a competent state. They pay high taxes, but they get good services back. We and the Greeks and a lot of people in Latin America and Italy and other places are in this low tax equilibrium where we don't like to pay taxes. Uh, we, uh, you know, therefore don't fund the government adequately. We don't give it enough authority, and then it doesn't perform well. And then we turn around and say, "Look, the government 
is incompetent, can't do anything, so why should I pay my taxes? Now, to be fair, we are better than the Greeks. Uh, and actually, the IRS is pretty good at collecting taxes. And um, you know, the level of tax compliance, voluntary tax compliance in the United States is much, much higher than it is in Greece. Uh, and the level of our public services is much higher. So I, I was putting us in the same category as the Greeks is a little bit facetious. But there is a little bit of that same pathology that you can get into this downward spiral where you don't want to pay taxes because you don't like the government, and then the government doesn't perform well, and that just reinforces your unwillingness to pay taxes. And that's not a good position to be in either. Um, Yes. You spoke of a pedagogical purpose in writing your book. Can mm -hmm. you, I mean, to the extent that teaching is about storytelling, mm -hmm. can you share kind of or, or encapsulate some of the narratives you think that fall out of this? Well, um, not a single narrative, but I, well, first of all, I do not think we teach enough history in general. Um, it's hard to know how to do that because there's so much history out there that you could teach, and it's very hard to know how to how to encapsulate that in a way that students can absorb, you know, on a broad basis. I found among my Stanford students, including the ones that are political science or international relations majors, that they've got a very, very spotty knowledge of basic contemporary history, and in fact. For most of them, the place where they learn most of it is in high school, in their AP, either American history or world history classes. Stanford does not teach that kind of class anymore. It doesn't. I mean, there's a big fight over Western Civ and you know whether there should be a core curriculum. And now, I mean, this is the season for evaluating applications for all sorts of things. And so I've been reading a lot of them. And you know, I read these transcripts of Stanford students that are very bright and they've done very well in school but they're completely incoherent you know they you know so they've got a history or humanities social science requirement so they take you know kind of a random course in you know kind of uh, aboriginal dance you know in the 19th century and you know another one and I mean whatever uh, you know, and it doesn't amount to actually a kind of broad knowledge, I think, of sort of the basic facts that you need to be an educated uh, person. <clears throat> now, a little bit more specifically about the narratives, this book, um, it is a world history in a certain sense. I concentrate on certain things that are typically not concentrated on, like the growth of bureaucracy and, you know, states. Um, I was trying to actually avoid this thing called Whig history, uh, which used to be very common in American history textbooks where basically you start from Greek democracy and go through you know, the Roman Republic to the Magna Carta to the Glorious Revolution to the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, all this one narrative about you know, how America got to be America. And it does seem to me that in the world we live in now, you actually have to know about other parts of the world. So this, the first volume of my book, actually spends most of the early chapters, once you get past tribal societies, on China. Because in my view, China actually was the first world civilization to create a modern state in the sense that I defined it in this presentation, uh, meaning centralized, bureaucratic, relatively impersonal. Uh, and I don't talk about Greece and Rome, and I've gotten a lot of people who have asked me why not and I just said you know it's not that it's not important but I just think that the a serious story of these other civilizations need to be told and the other problem I think with a lot of global histories is there is a problem of political correctness that the way that they're written you do not want to say anything negative about non-western civilizations and in fact there's kind of a bias to play up the achievements of non-western civilizations uh, and to emphasize, you know, colonialism and slavery and a lot of other not so nice things in, in the history of the West. And I also think that that's a mistake. I mean, you obviously have to confront all of these things. I think I do that in, you know, these two volumes. But I think you need to be able to talk about India and China and Africa and all these other places in a true comparative sense, meaning, uh, 
not with an agenda of either puffing them up or, you know, cutting them down to size. You just need to tell the story, you know, as as objectively as you can. So mm -hmm. that's my that's been my approach. Yeah. So I really want to know what you think about what I think is a brazen, almost unbelievable um, upsurge, as you said before, of specifically our elected officials. I think I'm thinking most recently of McConnell saying that uh, President Obama could choose all he wanted, but that the Senate was not going to even approximate mm -hmm. its job. Or just simply standing up and telling a lie, and um, yeah. So, so I mean, it seems to me that in my lifetime that has just blossomed in mushrooms, and I, I'm wondering what you think some of the reasons. Well, I don't think that telling lies on the part of politicians is a new thing. <laughs> if you go back in American history, well, so I think what the brazenness reflects is the polarization you know, that the stakes have risen because people are angry at each other and they're very divided on almost every issue. And therefore, they think of politics as a kind of zero-sum game, take no prisoners, you know, and therefore they're willing to do things like lie brazenly in order to get their way. Uh, and in, you know, earlier periods in the 20th century, there was more consensus, you know, and in fact, American Political Science Association in the 1950s wrote this uh, big study saying that the problem with the two American political parties are too similar, you know, and you don't get any real policy di divergence uh, between them. So I think that that's kind of a reflection of the, you know, our current polarization. Uh, you're going to have to excuse me because I need to get on a conference call at 3 o'clock, so I'm going to have to... <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you.